Welcome to Mormon Kabbalah 101. My name is David Fairman. I'm the first elder of the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. I was called to this ministry nearly four years ago. It will be four years ago next month, actually next week. I have been teaching Mormon Kabbalah for a year and a half. And this is the last class in the 101 series. Today we will be talking about the 12 Sephirot. I'd like to start with an opening prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before thee at this time and come to thee humbly in prayer to ask thee to bless us, to fill us with thy spirit, to thank thee for the opportunity that we have to participate in this class. Please bless us that after the class there will be a good and productive discussion on the things that we have learned. Please bless us that we will speak spirit to spirit. Please bless those that are listening to these classes after they are recorded, that they will feel thy spirit, that these lessons will help touch people's hearts and bring them closer to Christ and closer to thee. We thank thee for all of thy many blessings. We ask thee to be with us humbly, that your grace and wisdom and knowledge will be upon us, that we may gain understanding through your mercy and judgment. And these things we pray in the name of thy Son, even Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen. We're finally on the last class, the 12 Sephirot, the Tree of Life with the 10 Sephirot upon it. Those may be the most well-known symbol of Kabbalah. If you look at the symbol for the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship, you look at that symbol and you have the white tree from Lehi's dream and you have the Tree of Life, putting those two things together because Mormon Kabbalah is one of the things that is based upon and as I said in the first lesson, that's the Book of Mormon plus Kabbalah. Why didn't we talk about the 12 Sephirot first? Well, because while the 12 Sephirot may seem like the most basic part of Kabbalah, they may in fact actually be the most complex part. And by touching upon various aspects of the tree up to this point, I'm hoping that those that have been participating in this class are better prepared for what we're going to go over today. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 11.3 What is the fruit of the tree of life? It's a variety of things. It's wisdom, it's knowledge, it's mercy, it's God's love, it's our love for our neighbors. It's really everything that brings us to Christ and helps us to grow in that grace that he provides for us. Seeking the fruit of the tree of life, that is the fruit of righteousness. We grab hold of the iron rod and we move forward. We hold it our hands and try to bring others to the rod and to the tree with us. This scripture in Proverbs really sums up Lehi's reaction after eating the fruit of that tree. This last class is called the 12 Sephirot, but there are 10 Sephirot that we can see on the tree of life. What do we do with these Sephirot? There are a few different ways of using them. Some Kabbalah study and grow from attribute to attribute on the different paths, while others see them more as an Urim and Thummim. As an Urim and Thummim, the right and the left sides of the tree create a series of lenses for the natural eyes, and those center sephirot create a series of lenses for the third or spiritual eye. Through this Urim and Thummim, God helps us see both the physical realm and the higher metaphysical realms. In Mormon Kabbalah, we do both of these things. We use the Sephirot for growth and as seer stones. We grow from Sephirot to Sephirot in Christ's grace, seeing the world through spiritual eyes by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now in this lesson, I'm going to go over 10 words and 10 Beatitudes. The 10 words of Judaism are known in English as the Ten Commandments. If you remember the class on the Pardes, the Orchard of Kabbalah, you'll remember that there are four ways of looking at the scriptures. Peshat, the surface, Ramez, hence, Darash, concept, and Sod, the secret or the mystery. In going over this, we're going to use a little of Darash and a little of Sod. One of the things I've done is put together the Ten Commandments with the Ten Beatitudes. So what are these twelve Sephirot? The Sephirot within the Tree of Life represent various parts of the human body. There are ten visible on the tree of life, one invisible, and then the twelfth sephirot is the tree itself in Sof. Revelations 22.13 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. When Jesus came to earth, he did not come to end the law, but to fulfill it. And we can read that in Matthew 
17 through 18, and 3rd Nephi 5, 64 through 65 RAV, 12, 17 through 18 OPV. And he didn't just do this on the cross, but his entire life's work, his teachings. They were living the law. Jesus taught Kabbalah. This is one of the reasons people see Eastern philosophies in his version of Judaism. In traditional Kabbalah, messages are taught in parables, in code. And that's exactly how Jesus taught. The Alpha, or Aleph, the first Hebrew letter, is the ten words. And here, the Omega, or Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, are the Beatitudes. That's what Christ taught. We're going to read one, and we're going to read the other down, and we're going to put them together to gain greater knowledge and wisdom so that we can gain understanding. And we're going to put these together with the Sephirot. So let's go over just a quick overview of each Sephirot and how we can grow in our perspective with each of these as we grow closer to God. Starting at the top of the tree, we have Keter, crown. I am Jehovah, the Lord your Elohim. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Exodus 20, 2 and Matthew 5, 12. Keter is the topmost Sephirot. It's where we must begin with God. And it's where we end in God's presence. This crown is beyond mortal comprehension. We can reach this level only through Bina, the hidden Sephirot. It is the light of Keter that illuminates all of creation. It is the light that separates the darkness. Keter is the beginning and the end, with no beginning and no end. So Keter, again, is crown. It represents the top of the head, just above the head, or the third eye. The color that represents Keter is white, and its element is spirit, intelligence, priesthood, oneness. It's associated with I am, the power of God, the unity of God. Its herald is Enoch, or Metatron. Metatron is an archangel known as the recording angel, the chancellor of heaven. And in the creation story, Keter is the day before creation. It represents everything we were, everything God is, everything we will become. Keter is the utmost of the Sephirot in the middle line, and the middle line represents mildness or balance in the tree of life. In the Zohar, Keter is known as the most hidden of all hidden things because it is incomprehensible to finite beings such as ourselves. Only through God can this incomprehensible be known. Because of this, Keter teaches us humility. Matthew 20, 16 says, The last shall be first, the first shall be last. And that's exactly what it is. The top of the tree is where we start and it's where we end. If we wish to see the world through the Sephirot, our thoughts need to be pure. Our temperament must be gentle. Our face should be shining. Our ears should be listening to hear the good in all things and in all places. Our eyes should not seek evil, but always look for the good in all things. Our nose should be free from breathing anger, and our mouths should speak nothing but righteousness. The second sephirot is Da'at, which is Hebrew for knowledge. You shall have no other Elohim besides me. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Exodus 23, Matthew 5:11. The greatest wisdom is to know God, but this knowledge comes at a price. We must first put the false gods of pride and ego behind us. This may make us appear to be weak to the world because we've given ourselves to God as Christ gave his life for us. But this is the beginning of true knowledge. Now, you should understand that in traditional Kabbalah, Da'at sits between Bina, Hawkman, Heset, and Gevura. Knowledge is the mystery connected to Keter. But in Mormon Kabbalah, we switch these because knowledge is something that we seek and knowledge together combined with wisdom, we can have understanding. Da'at is on the left side of the tree and it represents the left eye. Its color is yellow and its element is air and air represents knowledge and intelligence. It is associated with Abba, the Father God, the Divine Masculine. Its herald is Jehovah, Y-H-V-H who many believe is the premortal Son of God, or Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. With Da'at, we are still sitting before the creation. So this is the knowledge. This is how to create. And because it represents the divine masculine, it's going to represent every form of bestowal, every masculine element of the creation itself. 
And in this, it helps us grow our determination to act upon and receive essential truths. Da'at is associated with memory and concentration, powers which rely upon one's recognition. In the Zohar, Da'at is referred to as the key that includes six. This key opens all six attributes of the heart. Combining Da'at with Hakma, which is Hebrew for wisdom, creates Bina, which is Hebrew for understanding. Knowledge may be gained by all, and wisdom may be obtained as well. Only by combining these two, through Christ's grace and the Holy Spirit, can we see with our third eye to gain true understanding, which is Keter. With the knowledge of God and the six attributes open, our Kli spills God's light into the invisible Sephirot, Bina, and into the world. So, Da'at helps us then on two levels, the lower level, the mundane world, and the higher level, Da'at Elyon, which is Hebrew for higher knowledge. It's also known as Da'at Hain Elam, which is Hebrew for hidden knowledge. The lower connects us to the intellect within the realm of emotions. This enhances our ability to act in accordance with the law in truth and righteousness. And what is the law? Love God, love your neighbor. The higher knowledge helps us in the mortal plane by giving us hidden knowledge from Keter, which is above Da'at on the tree. Next is Hakma Wisdom. You shall not take the name of YHVH Elohim for nothing. Blessed are all they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Exodus 27, Matthew 5.10 We have knowledge, and it's one thing to know that there is a God. But true wisdom, divine wisdom, dictates that we must submit to that God. We don't take upon ourselves the name of Christ in vain, but become the children of Christ, Christians. We let go of ego and begin the work of bringing heaven to earth. Knowledge without wisdom is vain, and wisdom without knowledge is empty. So together, knowledge and wisdom bring us understanding. Hakma represents the right eye. Its color is green. Its element is earth, and earth represents wisdom. It is associated with the Divine Feminine, the Queen of Heaven, Yah, Shekinah, God the Mother. Its herald is Melchizedek, or Raphael. As the King of Peace in his earthly life, Raphael holds the keys of organizing God's churches on the earth, giving to us the keys of offices of the High Priests and High Priestesses. Raphael was the angel in the Gospel of John stirring the water at the healing pool of Bethesda. Hakma represents the day before the creation. This is the wisdom, the why of the creation, representing the divine feminine. Everything that was to receive is part of the creation. And it grants us the keys of intuition, the light of Christ. Hakma is the uppermost of the Sephirot on the right line in the tree of life. Now, the left is the masculine, the right is the feminine. This Sephirot possesses two faces, the higher being the feminine half of Abba Allaha, the higher father, or in other words, this is our Heavenly Mother, the Queen of Heaven. The lower being the Mother of Israel, which is to say the Mother of the Body of Christ, or the Church of God. Hakma is associated with Eden and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, Wisdom, knowing right from wrong. This wisdom holds the key to God's light and must be unlocked by Da'at, which is knowledge, the Divine Masculine, and together the male and female halves unite to create within us Bina, understanding. So when God said, let us create man and woman in our image, this was Da'at and Hachma. More than just meaning wisdom, Hachma breaks down into two words, Chut, potential, and Ma, what is. And this is a reflection of what God says in Genesis. Man has become like us, able to know good from evil. Hachma sees the divine potential in us through Christ to inherit all that the father and mother have. And Hachma and Da'at shall be the faithfulness of thy times and safeguard of salvation. The fear of YHVH is his treasure. Isaiah 33.6 So we have this upper portion, the first three Sephirot. These are things that exist in the upper, the spiritual world. They're not above us. They're not beyond us. But they are above and beyond our current finite forms. These three combine together to form a trinity, if you will, of mystery and understanding the mystery. If you've been to any of the Book of Remembrance classes, we get into what the mystery is. And once you realize the mystery, once you learn the mystery, you understand it's not that it's mysterious because it's unknowable. It's mysterious because until we understand it, we can't accept it. The fourth Sephirot in the Tree of Life is Heset, Mercy. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy in him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Exodus 28, Matthew 5, 9. Jesus taught us the Sabbath was made for mankind, not mankind for the Sabbath. And that's in Mark 2, 27. Sabbath is when we cease our labors and turn them over to God, submitting fully to him, understanding that we cannot perfect ourselves except through Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of God's mercy for us. So as we follow him, turning our lives over to the Prince of Peace, we become peacemakers. And in doing so, we represent God's mercy. Hesed is the right hand of God. And as we know, the right hand of God is Christ. So it is associated with YHVH, Jesus Christ, being the Son of God on the right hand of the Father. Its color is blue, and its herald is John the Baptist, who is Zedekiel. This is the archangel of freedom, benevolence, and mercy, and the patron angel of all who forgive. With Hesed, we have finally reached the first day of creation. It is on this day that light is divided from the darkness, creating light and knowledge, love and kindness, and all creation is embraced in love as one. All things are in harmony, in balance. Hesed is the first sephirot in the attribute of action in the Kabbalistic tree of life. The Bahir states, the fourth is the righteousness of God, his mercies and kindness with the entire world. This is the right hand of God. So as Christians, we know God's mercy and the right hand of God is Jesus Christ. Hesed then is the sephirot that manifests God's absolute unlimited benevolence and kindness. Hesed is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending of the law. Hesed teaches us to extend mercy to others as God has extended mercy to us. With Hesed, we go the extra mile. And as we're faithful to our covenants with God, we are forgiven of past deeds. There's a really good example of this in King Benjamin's address, and that's in chapter 2 of Mosiah and the RAV in chapter 4 on the OPV. Hesed enables us to pick up our cross and follow Christ because the Savior makes our burdens light. The fifth sephirot is Givira, which is judgment. Reverence your father and your mother. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Exodus 20, 12, Matthew 5, 8. Who is the mother and father we must reverence? In this instance, when we're talking about the tree of life, we're referring to those that came before us. What has come before us in the tree of life? Da'at and Hakma. As we do this, we are judged and found worthy, having been washed clean already by Christ's mercy. Being pure in heart, our perception changes. We see the world through new eyes. As we grow in grace, we see things more and more as God sees them. We see God's hand in everything around us, and eventually, in a very real way, we will see God. Gevura represents the left hand of God. Its color is red. Its element is fire, which is cleansing. It's associated with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Its herald is Adam or Michael. Michael means one who is like God. He is the chief archangel who led God's armies against Satan's forces in the war of heaven. And according to the book of Revelation 12, 7 through 9, he defeats Satan. As Adam, he's the Ancient of Days, the Prince, and the Patriarch of the whole human family, Daniel 7. As a day of creation, we're now at the second day. On this day, God divided the waters from the waters, the heavens from the earth. Likewise, we're able to separate the worldly from the spiritual to help us finish the creation. Just as the rain pours down from the heavens and evaporates up to the clouds, we too must make that which is above and below unified. We've got to bring it together. As above, so below. As below, so above. This creates the inner balance between the physical and the spiritual worlds that we live in. Gevura is den, the essence of judgment. If we're saved by Christ, the Holy Spirit cleanses us with fire. However, if we're wicked, we are burned, as those same flames become hellfire. Gevura, then, is both God's mode of perfecting the saints and punishing the wicked, judging humanity in general. This is the fulfillment of the law and the strict meeting out of justice. It stands in contrast to Hesed because Christ's mercy protects us from the fire. But that's where the balance comes in. That's where we have both mercy and justice met. It is because of Hesed that Giver is associated with the powers to bestow goodness upon others. That cleansing fire becomes Christ's light of creation, and that's us being born again that new person inside of us, growing grace by grace. Gevura allows us to overcome our true enemies, whether they come from without, Satan, or from within, ego. 
The sixth sephirot on the tree of life is Tiferet, compassion. You shall not murder. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Exodus 20.13, Matthew 5.7 Ego is a destroyer. It is prideful and selfish. With our new eyes, we see things as they are, which opens our ability to love others, even those we don't know or those that have hurt us. Because of this, we're able to stop the selfish cycle of pride ego brings, which is murder, and extend mercy. We extend this mercy because we've been given mercy. God has judged us and made us whole. We, in turn, want, we desire to bring the same light and life that we have received into the world. Tiferet is Hebrew for beauty, and the body part it represents is the bosom. Its color is gray, and its element is spirit just like Keter, which makes sense because it is in that middle pillar of the Tree of Life. The Herald of Tiferet is Joseph Smith Jr., or Ariel. Ariel is a divine messenger of the Holy Spirit. Tiferet represents the third day of creation. This is the day that dry ground appears, and the plants are born into existence. With dry ground, we're able to resolve conflict. With vegetation, we're able to do so with compassion. Tiferet is the bosom where we feel the Holy Spirit and where the light of Christ overflows from our clea to fill the world. It occupies a place in the middle pillar of the Tree of Life as it is a lower reflection of Keter. Tiferet is a unique Sephirot as it is connected to all of the other Sephirot, with the exception of Malkuth. It is tied to all the subjective paths of the unconscious. One might say that it's the Philosopher's Stone of the Tree of Life. It's the restoration of all things, because it contains a transmutative property. When we choose good, it allows God's light to pour from us, changing us and the world. When we choose evil, it pollutes us, and that pollution goes out and pollutes the world. So Tiferet represents the sun, as it takes a central place in the tree of life, just as the sun is at the center of our solar system. It's not the center of the universe, but it still gives light in life. Like man, it didn't create itself, so Tiferet can really be seen as a metaphor for mankind's role in the creation. Because on the body, that's where it is. It's, it's in that spot where the light pours out from us to create Tekanolam, to repair the world. Now up to this point, all of these Sephirot point to the Godhead or the Trinity. If you look at them and draw lines to connect them, you will create a Star of David. The first article of faith states, We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and Eternal Mother, and in the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. So we have Da'at representing the Father, the Divine Masculine, Chokmah representing Wisdom, the Divine Feminine, Hesit, Mercy, Jesus Christ, Gevura, Judgment, the Holy Spirit. Those are the four points on the right and the left of the Star of David. At the top is the crowned, the unknowable portion of God, the infinite And at the very opposite, at the bottom of the Star of David, we have mortality. The infinite is understood through the Eternal Father, Eternal Mother, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as it filters through all of these, it connects with us there on Tiferet. And through us, it can be projected out into the world. The seventh Sephirot on the Tree of Life is Netzach, which is Hebrew for eternity and represents endurance. You shall not stray from the law or the covenant. Blessed are all they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Exodus 20.14, Matthew 5.6 That light of Christ, that compassion that we've been given, is going to be tested. Ego is going to try to rise again, telling us we don't need God, that we're somehow above the law, etc. Now we are saved, but we're not above the law. We're still God's covenant people. And just as God will keep his covenant with us, we must keep ours with him. The cycle of staying hungry for righteousness and keeping the law as we understand it is how we grow in grace. And that's the endurance. That's Netzik. It represents the right foot. Its color is light yellow. Its element is air. It's associated with Moses. Its herald is Moses or Hanel, also known as Jophiel, one of the seven archangels. Netzach represents the fourth day of creation. On this day, God creates the lights in the heaven for signs and seasons. These lights, they give us the ability to act, to bring the spiritual to the physical world, to do the works of God. These works are the union of heaven and earth. And what is the lights of the heavens that Moses brought us? The Torah. Netzach is one of the tactical sephirot. 
its purpose is not directed towards itself, but rather to assist in another work. And we saw this in Moses' early ministry when he led the Israelites out of bondage, but not into the promised land. So this sephirot marks a turning point. We may change to act as free agents for God rather than slaves to sin. Nesik marks endurance, the patience to follow through on our passions without being overcome by them. That's the 40 days in the wilderness. It's leadership. It's bringing others to a cause. It's motivating them to act. Nesik answers the question, how shall mankind receive God's message? How can God's will be done effectively? Like I said, it was Moses that brought us the law through the Torah. What's the law? Love God, love your neighbor. What's the Torah? It's an instruction manual trying to help us as human beings figure out how to love God and love our neighbor. Nesek teaches us strength, endurance, long-suffering, and patience. The eighth sephirot on the tree of life is hod, which is Hebrew for glory and represents submission. You shall not take more than you've earned, nor that which isn't given you. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Exodus 20.15, Matthew 5.5 5. Only in meekness can we gain all that the father and mother have for us. We cannot take anything that isn't ours. We really can't even desire it, because that's coveting. Meekness means accepting what God has given us and nothing more. Once we gain understanding, a true godly perspective, we begin to understand it's not that good things happen to bad people, it's more that things happen to all of us, good and bad. We realize it's our reaction to these things that determine who we are and not the causality. So Hod represents the left foot. Its color is orange and its element is fire. It's associated with Elohim Zevat, the god of hosts. His herald is Moroni. And Moroni, by the way, is an Arabic term that means at the place of fire. Moroni was the last Nephite. He's the one that, after losing the war and being driven away, buried the gold plates for Joseph Smith to translate or, or divine, however you want to say that. Hod represents the fifth day of creation. It's on this day that the fish and the fowl are created. This gives us the power to move forward in Christ. These are two things that move through the water and the air. That allows us to acknowledge and thank God in submission to the divine will. Hod is connected to prayer and submission. Rather than the conqueror, Hod teaches us to subdue our passions. As we all know, there are times when our prayers just aren't answered the way that we want. When this happens, we have to submit our will to God. It may seem like a defeat in the mundane world, but these setbacks aren't really setbacks. They're progress leading to greater success in the spiritual world. Representing a foot, the left foot, this sephirot represents action. Action to move us forward rather than backward in defeat. So Hod, you could say, is a tactical sephirot. It teaches us what to do when the wicked prosper. Because as Christians, we understand that ultimately God is going to win in the end. And really, we saw this in the example with Moroni the last Nephite. Like I said, he buried the gold plates. He watched over them. But in the last days, that record he buried and sealed has been given up. Parts of it have been translated. Hod is the work that we need to follow through on ideas to make sure that they happen. So Hod is, in a sense, the follow-up, the work needed to go all the way to complete the ideas to make things happen. The ninth Sephirot on the Tree of Life is Yasad, which is Hebrew for foundation. You shall not bear false witness or testimony against your neighbors. Blessed are all they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Exodus 20.16, Matthew 5.4 All the sephirot up to this point are about inner transformation with outward effects. The foundation of true transformation lies in how we interact with and not just perceive the world around us. We seek and speak truth. We don't judge others. And we're a comfort to those that stand in need of comfort. These are the actions of a Christian keeping their baptismal covenants. Why? Because this is the light of God from Keter, as it shines forth into the world through our actions. And these are not the actions we do for ego, because we've shed ego and pride for godly altruism. So this then is us acting, doing the works of God. This is the very foundation of righteousness. On the body, Yasad is represented by the reproductive organs. Its color is light blue, and its element is water. It's associated with El Shaddai, which is Hebrew for God Almighty. Its herald is Noah, who is Gabriel. 
This is the archangel who typically serves as God's messenger. He's probably best known for announcing Jesus' birth to the shepherds. You saw it also represents the sixth day of creation. This is the day the beasts and mankind are created. So this allows us to ground ourselves in God's truth to utilize spiritual power. This is the bridge between heaven and earth, allowing us to walk the narrow path. You saw it as the foundation God has built the world upon. Because of this, it serves as a transmitter between worlds, the Sephirot above and the mundane reality below. It's been placed in the center of the tree so the light of the upper Sephirot can gather in Yasad and then be channeled down to Malkut below through one's third eye. And remember, Yasad is associated with the sexual organs, the part of the body that has been given the power of creation. So while the floods drowned people in Noah's time, so too did they bring life back into the world. Yasad collects the vital forces of the Sephirot above and transmits them to the world below and the earth is then able to interact with the divine. And this brings us to the 10th and final visible sephirot on the tree of life, Malhut. In English, this means kingdom, but it represents exaltation. Because what is the kingdom? It is those that receive exaltation. You shall not long for that which you do not have. Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Exodus 20, 17, Matthew 5, 3. We're now walking the path of exaltation in our innermost thoughts and outer expressions. We're transforming into new beings. Rather than yearning for worldly possessions, dividing people up between the haves and the have-nots, and looking at the world as something we desire, we're now spiritual beings seeking spiritual needs. By seeking entry into heaven, we've now seen that heaven isn't a destination to arrive at or journey towards or to, but it's a state of mind that we have brought to earth. Malhut is at the bottom, the foundation, because now everything above it is available to mankind. So the body part that Malhut represents is the earth itself. Its color is light green and its element is the earth. It's associated with Adondai, Shekinah, Eden. These last two, by the way, names referring to our Heavenly Mother, the Divine Feminine. Its herald is Elijah, or Sandalphim. And this is the angel mentioned in Revelation 19.10, the angel that holds the sealing keys of ascension. It also represents the seventh day of creation, the day that God rests, the Sabbath. As God rests, he turns the task of creation to us. We are given the word the power to speak God's message. We invite others to the path, not by force, not by coercion, but through peace and our own personal self-correction. Malhut sits at the bottom of the tree. As I stated, the Sephirot represents Eden as a symbol of the bride, which is the church, the body of Christ upon the earth. Malhut is the first lens of one's third eye, the mundane lens, if you will. Rather than emanating from God like other Sephirots, it emanates from us, God's creation, reflecting God's glory from within us because mankind was created in God's image. Even though it's the last Sephirot, it's also the first because it's the root. The last shall be first and the first shall be last, Matthew 20:16. This creates an eternal loop between Keter and Malhut, the creator and the creation, God and the offspring. God's divine energy comes down and finds its expression in this realm through us. God grants us the priesthood, God's power, to bring that energy back around in a circle and travel back and forth up and down the tree of life. The hidden Sephirot, or the eleventh Sephirot, is Bina, which is Hebrew for understanding. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwell with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Leviticus 19, 18, 33 through 34, and Matthew 5, 44 through 45. So we close at the beginning. We began seeking God, knowledge, wisdom, mercy, and judgment, and we arrive at understanding. Understanding teaches us that to know God is to know our fellow man. Remember, when we look in the face of a stranger, of a fellow human being, 
that fellow human being was created in God's image. We are only looking at our God or a reflection of our God. True wisdom is to see the good in God's creation. True mercy is not merely to seek mercy, but to extend it. True judgment is forgiveness. Understanding is peace. Peace is love, and everything rests on love. The more we learn to love, the more we will understand the will of God. I really can't express that enough. So the body part that this sephirot represents is our soul. Its color is light gray. Its element is spirit. It's associated with Elohim. Its herald is Enoch, who is Zephkiel, the watchman of God, an archangel over wisdom, understanding, and judgment, the chief of the order of thrones, and one of the nine angels that rule heaven. This archangel helps make messages clearer to us. So this is Enoch's name when acting as a herald for Bina, because Enoch also represents, as Metatron, Keter. And as we know, Bina is a reflection of Keter. So the seven days of creation are up. Bina represents the path. Just as Keter is the power of creation itself, this is the consciousness, the reason for the creation. Keter is the crown, the heavens. Bina is, in a sense, the spiritual portion of the earth. It is through Bina that we may gain access to Keter, to see the eternities. It is balance. It is the iron rod. It is the invisible narrow path. Resting between but below Da'at and Chachma, and between but above Hesed and Gevura, Bina is the understanding that comes from knowledge and wisdom. But it can only be reached after one is cleansed by God's mercy and God's fire, God's judgment. Bina is the Holy Spirit giving us intuitive understanding. It's the contemplation given to us by Christ's grace. It's the womb. It's the temple inside of us housing the Spirit of God. It is the birth or the rebirth of our soul. In a mundane way, Bina can also represent deductive reasoning. This is God helping us to understand things as we're seeking answers. All of the light and knowledge that has blessed our lives comes from God, even if it doesn't come from someone who is a godly person. Bina, then, is the sephirot that assists those that aren't fully connected to God. And in that sense, Bina can be a rational process within a person which guides us to develop an idea to its fruition. To be clear here, the difference between using the Sephirot properly to access Bina and God using Bina to bless us, the creation, with understanding is the same as the difference between a scalpel and a hammer. So, like I said, scientific breakthroughs and revelations are both types of guidance that can be given to us through Bina because they're both understanding from divine knowledge and wisdom and they're given to us by God. And lastly, the twelfth Sephirot is Insof, the tree of life itself. Insof is Hebrew for everlasting. And the Lord God said, Behold, mankind has become like one of us, to know good and evil. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Genesis 3.22, Matthew 5.48 Insof isn't a term that you'll read in the Bible itself. It is a traditional Kabbalistic name for God that's been used for about a thousand years or so. And this is because Jews do not utter God's name. In Hebrew, it literally means infinite light, but figuratively, it means everlasting. And the tree of life is nothing if it isn't everlasting. We cycle through the 32 paths of the 10 visible sephirot in an upward spiral. These are the fruits of pardes, which is Hebrew for orchard. And while it may feel at first as though we're walking in circles, Looking back, we realize that we've been climbing the mountain of the Lord all along. The way I like to describe it is, you see yourself walking in this spiral around and around and around. But what you don't realize is that spiral has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter as you moved up and up and up until the next thing you know, you look back and realize you're now on a straight line.